about what the reasons were that you guys decided to pull together Empire Fund. How did it come together? Like, what were you guys trying to do? Was there a catalytic moment that kind of set it all off? So what's the origin story of the Empire Fund? Yeah, what's the creation story <laughs> of the Empire Fund? I mean, we have different versions. Um, me and Candy were speaking around 2008. So 2008, mind you, this is around the time of Kaba Modern on America's Best Dance Group, right? Um, <laughs> 2008, and uh, FPAC was happening. I was one of the main uh, organizers for FPAC at that time, which is the Philippine Festival of Philippine Arts and Culture in LA. Um, it happens every year. This time it's going to be in downtown LA this year. So I was one of the main organizers. We invited Joe Bataan to come and speak. And this is um, September 2008. Bamboo was there. Uh, Krish was there. Candy was there. Uh, Red Matic came uh, to, to FPAC and gave awards out um, to, to DJs, to Filipino DJs. Um, DJ Babu. Who else? The folks. Um, but we had a little round table. Nasty Ness, that's right. Yes. Nasty Ness was yes. there. So we had a, a round table before the festival at Lost Souls Cafe in downtown. Oliver Wang was there. And we just talked about, you know, what is this thing in Filipino Americans and hip hop? A little conversation that we had, and um, you know, Oliver and me and Candy were talking. We should do a book sometime. You know, is this something we can do? And like, I don't know where to begin with that. It was just something, you know, a fantasy. Um, but we stayed in conversation, and we made a website. So I don't know if you all are familiar with the old school Empire Fund website. Uh, we collected stories, and, and uh, almost all of those stories are now in the book. And Rod came on board about maybe a year and a half ago and made this help to make this book happen and help shape shape the book for us. Um, so that was that was my version. Is the Kaba Modern was something I think was on people's minds and we're like this is you know Kaba Modern is great. They're on TV, but there's a big story behind that and no one is t talking about that that story of Kaba Modern aside from MTV. There's like 20 years prior to that that people aren't even talking about, right? So. That's kind of where, where I come in. That's definitely um, an origins of the book too, but I think even before I even was talking to Mark about the book too, it was a conversation I had with you back at the <laughs> National Hip Hop Political Convention, and we were just talking, we made a hip hop timeline of APIA folks who are doing hip hop and or spoken word, and we kind of made that timeline, and you're like, Ken, you're gonna write this book one day? I'm like, you're right, no way, no right. <laughs> And then, and then it evolved, and then me and Mark, and then all the things that Mark was mentioning in terms of how the other parts of the origins of the of like envisioning this book and the possibility of this book happening. I had no part in it. My introduction to the book was actually through the website. I was one of the contributors to the website. Um, and then I think where the actual publication comes in is, I was at a conference and I think I was doing a, a presentation on, I think it was on Bamboo, uh, talking smack about him at a, at a <laughs> conference. And then after the conference, a publisher approached me and was like, hey, we're interested in the work that you do. We're interested in there's I think this was post Kaba Modern, Massive Monkeys, all of this stuff. Um, a lot of focus on Filipino American hip hop, and basically asked if I had a project in the pipeline. I was actually already working. I was working on a different project, um, and but I said, "Hey, I know these other folks who are doing something," and I think that's when uh, that became part of the catalyst to to get it published in, in the form that you see now. Talk a little bit about, um, you know, there's such a rich diversity of, of voices in the book, and I, I'm just curious how you guys made the decision to go so huge, and what kinds of things were involved in trying to think about how to capture the entirety of the, maybe not the entirety, but, you know, to capture the Filipino-American experience in hip-hop. How did you guys conceive of that? The other week, I tried to count how many people are in the book, like people who contributed artwork, people we interviewed, 
um, etc. There's over 60 people in this book. 60, right? That's crazy. And that's not even enough. So, you know, we got people like, am I in it? You know, so we didn't capture even a fraction of the, the story we can tell with the larger hip hop, um, Filipino American experience in hip hop. Um, so I think it's naturally like we, we had no choice but to be collaborative and to have, a, a, like, that's the only way to do it. You know what I'm saying? So to have the artists speak themselves was just common sense like that it, you know that was not even like a thing to debate about it's like okay what we should make a book about this we should have the artists themselves speak we should interview the artists who you know make that easier if you want to uh, compact eight people um, into into one chapter and we did that we have you know ten nine people in some chapters and the filmmaking one for example um, because there's just that many people involved with the debut you know that movie is so important so we have to have all those people speak you know so that's just one point um, I think we, I remember starting off really small and then growing in that and we did some small ways of open call to open submission, we did a little small thing of that to really hard in a large way to promote it in a large way and we did that for the website, you know, we had people did submissions through that um, and then we grew and then next you know it's just like all these folks and there was a lot of people we asked and reached out to as well that couldn't contribute, meet, you know, meet the timeline we had as well, and that was hard, and it, I know for me, individually, when I've been asked to write for different books, it takes me a long time, like two years, and <laughs> submissions for books, so it's a, it's definitely a process, and, and when people also have their own lives, too, to submit, there was a lot of people we wanted involved, but that couldn't submit um, due to many things. So even though we have a lot of people in, in this book, we always say that it's not comprehensive, right? And that it's just a starting point. Um, and that part of our idea was to kind of capture at the moment the folks who are contributors. And, and I think really the idea, again, as, as Mark and, and Kenny were saying, you know, we wanted the artists to speak. We could have had a bunch of scholars who just wrote about people but at the same time, we also wanted to, to make sure that the, the artists themselves had the, the space um, to be able to talk. Um, and then also, I think over a bunch of our Skype conversations, we did want to make sure that geographically people were represented, um, whether we were really that looking at particular historical moments or we were looking at issues around sexuality, make sure that folks were actually represented um, or at least that we made a, a, a very sincere attempt to make sure that uh, folks were involved in the project. So being on the West Coast here might be familiar with more, you know, LA, artists in LA, in the Bay, Seattle even. If you want to learn about New York and Filipinos there, this book will tell you about that. Because <laughs> Candy, you know, her sister, uh, the B-boy, right? Uh, what's his name, Jerome? Or, um, oh, Mike. Mike. And in the, the Gorilla Words, you're going to learn about New York City and New Jersey yeah. in this book. So geographically, we want to spread out. I, I give a shout out Virginia. to, and Virginia as well, and I give a shout out to uh, Jacksonville. Uh, Chicago, we couldn't pick we up tried. everybody. Pacifics couldn't. Yeah, they but we, we attempted to. We tried. Um, so me being from Florida, I wanted some Florida representation in there, and, and I had my homie um, Leo. He gave a contribution about um, the, the party scene in, in Jacksonville, Florida. Um, but yeah, so we wanted geographically this to be right. Hawaii is also super central in this book too. Alright, so um tell us a little bit about like what you guys thought you were what kinds of holes you guys were plugging with Empire of Funk in terms of the study of uh, or knowledges of Filipino Americans, Filipino American knowledge in terms of hip hop. Knowledge, hip hop, hip hop knowledge, just in general, just in terms of of, of uh, what you guys are trying to plug. Like, what what did you need to fill the gap that I think, you needed to fill? I think you're spot on with the whole local. Like everybody in this book has a local story to tell, and I, I know trans local is the next conversation at, at one o'clock. But when you're talking about hip hop was very local, and Filipinos were had their own local scenes. That's what I'm familiar with. Like I grew up in Long Beach and in, in Florida, and what we did was we, we heard about like other dance scenes everywhere else, like in, in Seattle. Seattle was huge for us for some reason. Like we saw their power moves, 
like doing, I think it was Boss Crew, mm -hmm. and we saw them doing like crazy stuff. But we had our own scene in, in Long Beach, my brother's scene in, in Florida. Um, it was local, we just did it because it was fun. We did it because everybody else was doing it. You know, they had a dance crew, you had a debut, and in the debuts, you had the, the women who were, the, you know, the young women dancing with their friends. And, and if you had like a, a barrio fiesta or whatever at the church, you had a dance group, right? Um, I think so, for me personally, it's to, to connect the locals, to show that it was not just Jacksonville, us by ourselves, and to let, let the LA people know that Jacksonville existed, <laughs> right? To say, hey, there, there's Filipinos, there's a lot, you know, it's, it's a Navy base. And in, in, in New York, connect those folks with what's going on in, in um, LA, Bay Area. So I think for me, it, my personal investment was to show that the local is just not local, simply and that's, that's the end of it. It's that they're somehow connected. People are doing the same things and they're not aware of it, right? So that's, that's the whole I was trying to build. I think definitely about story. Um, and it's something I always say is like, you know, it's important for, for people to tell their stories, otherwise people aren't gonna tell it for you. And individually telling our own story. And for me, um, you know, I never saw myself as a writer or, <clears throat> and even though it was something I always loved to do and wanted to do and, and did in my own spare time whenever I felt, I never felt like a good writer because I didn't write that way, you know, or that way or the academic or scholarly way or whatever. I can fake the funk and act like I do, <laughs> you know, because I'm pretty good at picking up language and jargon. But at the same time, you know, I wanted to tell an experience and I wanted to make sure that outlet was there for others. And I think for me it was about that, whether it's locally and, and as much as possible, you know, try to see that. Like we have Noah in the book talking about um, his transnational experience from New York to living in LA to the Philippines, now living in the Philippines. And, you know, we again, like, it doesn't stop here. You know, we want to make sure, like, we're going to continue the website, more stories will be collected, more interviews will be done, and then, who knows, maybe it'll lead to a second volume. Yeah. yeah, I just want to second that about the story thing. Like, I think the Cabo Modern stuff was great, like, to have that, people just going wild over that, oh, you know, Jabberwockies, and they're so hot, you know? Like, you know, I was hearing all different ethnicities, women were, like, just all over this this phenomenon of the, the B-Boys. Um, but at the same time, it's like, okay, people were really wanting to write about this and name this without asking the actual Filipinos themselves. Like, oh, this thing is, oh, they're, they're Asian, and this is something that we can talk about and celebrate. And so I wanted to make sure that, or a lot of us wanted to make sure that that history is, is that context is spelled out. It's not just there and then we're celebrating it and we're good at dancing. That was like the narrative is that, we are good at dancing too, you know, Asian people, you know? And I heard that, that was like the narrative of, of the internet was Asians can dance. I'm like, yeah, but, right, there's a whole history of, of, of explaining that and giving context to that. Um, and, you know, what about the Filipinos specifically within that? Um, so that was, you know, it was dangerous, it was scary, but I wanted to make sure to give context to, to that moment. For me, <clears throat> this is really self-serving <laughs> because I teach classes on Filipino Americans, Filipino Asian Americans, popular culture, and I always play music, um, do all of this, and I wanted to be able to have a, a text and so I could go, here's what we're going to study this semester. And at the same time, I also wanted it to be a, a, a document that said, this is about Filipinos, but it's also about Filipinos who are talking about themselves in different ways. That being Filipino is not singular. That being Filipino stretches across different times, different places. And that whether we're sharing particular historical times or we're sharing particular spaces, that there are different ways that we, we can understand what it means to be Filipino. And that we're doing this in a bunch of different ways, right? And culturally, we're doing it in a bunch of different ways. And for me, that's what, what I wanted out of this. And that's what I was looking to do. And again, it's also very self-serving, because then now it's easy. I, can, I have a book that I can use in my class. And how people are going to hate it, because they have to class. 
<laughs> they love it. They love it. They love it. They want to go and get everybody's autographs, which I like to do too. All right, so, uh, should we open it up to the audience? Any questions? Any questions you have of uh, of our of our illustrious um, co-editors here about the project, about the book? Yes. You can stand too, so we can all hear you. Thank you. in my classes, people in the Philippines prefer to speak English anyways. So if they're in Cebu, they don't want to, it's hard to read Tagalog for a lot of people. So, you know, maybe in Spanish that may make sense in the United States. In the Philippines, that's a much more politically tricky thing because it's an Anglophone country. So. Yeah. Okay. And I just feel like when you speak in your, like, your native tongue, that's a resistance to like, uh, just like, uh, dominant like Western ideologies or beliefs, you know. So it's like very like powerful you can understand it from like your mother land or something. So yeah, thank you. Come to the concert tonight, you'll hear some illustrious <laughs> artists speaking <laughs> bilingual, right? Talk about it. Uh other questions. Oh, yes, over here. Um I know you guys <coughs> mentioned uh I feel awkward saying so. <laughs> but, uh, I know you did mention uh, Cabo Modern in 2008, and I remember um, that was one of the first things that really inspired me to dance to. Um, and I also remember that most of the members on that stage were actually not Filipino, if I remember correctly. Some of them were Korean um, or other Asian cultures. And uh, I just wanted to um, ask, you know, like, what's your opinion on that? Um, a non-Filipino um, culture representing a Filipino. Everybody heard the question in the back? Yeah? Okay, cool. Alright, Mr. Wei, the DJ for tonight, the concert. Um, DJ Wei, is that how you want to say it? Uh, feng Shui. Okay, Feng Shui, our uh, empire of Feng Shui. <laughs> <laughs> um, so the question was about Kaba Modern on MTV and they're not Filipino, you know, how do we feel about that? Um, I mean, that was a big deal on the internet, that was a huge debate. Um, I mean, I don't know, I think for me personally, it was something that was worth talking about and I invited that conversation because it, it, it made people confront the idea that Filipinos were doing this for a long time before this. So it's like, where are the Filipinos? And people would just be like, get angry at each other because it doesn't matter, but it does matter, it doesn't matter, you know? Um, I think for TV, it's great, right? Like people will have fans and people will uh, you know, uh, be attached to different characters on, on the stage or whatever. Um, <coughs> but for Filipinos, it was, it was you know, like, where are we? And there's, there's different reasons of why that occurred. So if, if people are wondering what happened, I'm sure Arnel can talk about this later um, when he's on the, on the panel, um, the, the founder of Cabo Bono, Arnel Calvario. But there was logistical reasons why they, those Filipinos who were on the crew couldn't make it, right? So it wasn't intentionally, let's cut out the Filipinos because we don't like them. It wasn't, it wasn't like that. It was because they had other things to do, other priorities. Um, and so the only people available were those who were not Filipino. So I don't know, be it what it was. I mean, I think it was a good thing to have the conversation. Um, did it give do an injustice to the actual name Kaba Modern? Maybe, sure, whatever. But I don't think that's the, the issue at point. I think the issue at point is that we can now talk about it and give context to it and make books like this, right? Um, so, yeah. I think we have time for one more question. I saw your hand over So that, oh, so she, you were asking um, how 
what are some words of wisdom in terms of how do we better like support folks in, in music and or arts in general to to speak for, them to speak for themselves. Okay. I think for me, I feel that it is to understand and value all forms of ways we document our lives and not just in writing. Because I think what we forget, first of all, we live in a colonized world where the language, English itself, is colonized. So I think we have to understand that language comes in many forms. In nature, the trees is a language. When we hear the wind blow, it's a language. So, you know, that's why we need to give respect to the earth itself. So, and to understand the ways in which we all document, and hip hop is such a big representation of that, because we are documenting every day when we dance, when we do DJ, that is a form of documentation. Although I also um, think it's important to also write our stories in, in ways so that way we can pass that down, which is why this book isn't existent, but to still, this is breaking up, um, yeah, um, is to, See, I'm a DJ, I'm not supposed to be in the mic. But anyway. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so like it's it's that understanding that value of different ways of how we express and letting that shared space happen. Because I think while we also speak in ways of like being on a panel and the ways in which we write and put it in a book, I think that's when we create these binaries. That's when we create these divisions and gaps. That's when it becomes academia versus this. And I think we need to show value to all forms of ways we express. And that's how we show support. I think that was part of the politics of this book is like, why a book? Like, how does this do a service to what you're talking about of marginalized voices? Will the book even help, right? So that was one of the things we debate is not everybody's gonna read it. Like, they're gonna buy it for the cover art or whatever. So one, one thing we wanted to emphasize is art. You know, like have the, you know, Manila Rice is in the house. Uh, we, we wanted to make sure that we had artwork in there as a central voice itself, right? Um, and so we made the website uh, to uh, accompany this and it's still in, in works, but we want to make sure that we have videos on the website, make it organic, make it very uh, visual. Um, and so we understand that not everybody's gonna read. That's just straight up. My mom's not gonna read this. She's gonna buy it. I think. Yeah, <laughs> I signed it. Yeah, I'm like, I'm gonna devalue it. I don't know. So, um, but not everybody reads it. But for classrooms, people who want to take classes, they've been begging for this, right? So for Rod's classes, he's been teaching this stuff for a long time. This is a tool. So there's one tool out of many different ways we can teach this stuff. Uh, but we understand the politics of like not everybody is gonna read or want to read. There's, there's also the politics of publishing. Yeah, that's true. Right. Because we had lots of discussions. Everything from why am I, who has like the, whatever the academic background, why am I not the first author? Right? That kind of stuff. And um, that was, that was you know, the big thing. Because I insisted I would, that I should be third. Right, um, oh, yeah. that and that was actually a big thing with our publisher because they had approached me initially, but <laughs> they wanted me last because I didn't have the PhD. No, first of all, I, I that's why I reacclaimed myself as Doctor DJ Cutting Candy to kind of be like, you know, I, I self acclaim. I don't got a college degree. I don't got a BA. I don't got none of that. But I'm just as smart as you, and I can send a panel do that. Yeah. You know, so. It's Irvine, you mean? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, my letters are DJ. That's my name. <laughs> yeah. No, so those are the other th the other kind of kinds of considerations, particularly if you want to publish, if you want to do it as a, a textual thing, right? So those are other things, and, and Jeff can probably speak to this way more in terms of the politics of, of publishing, because when you put it down on paper and you're working with presses and things, it's a, it's a different being. Just uh, one more time for one more question, I think. Okay, uh, anybody else? Right here, I'm sorry. Um, 
like uh, just going off on of what you said, you uh, mentioned about like how long it took for the publishing. So like, um, I guess the main question is, um, how how much red tape did you have to go through to even get this project going? Like, I mean, like some people, I'm not, I know it's not the same, but like some people like throwing jams, they have to like go through the administration and um, get it forwarded, and it might take them a while for even them to green light it. So like, the basic question is like, how long did it take you guys to like go through all these jumps and hoops? So because the publisher approached me, it was, uh, I think it was much faster than it usually is. Um, and then the, the good thing um, was that they already had a project that was going, right? And so um, in terms of, there's, I mean, there's a whole bunch of different things too because I think also the conversation that we were having with the publisher was, how come you don't have more scholars that are in this book? Amber Alert. Yeah, we can hear. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Everybody get the Amber Alert? <laughs> yeah, they... She shouldn't be talking about publishing. <laughs> the politics of publishing. <laughs> publishing, because usually publishing books takes a long time. Right, and there's lots of, like, a lot of different things that go into to publishing books. And that's, I mean, and that's the other thing that we, part of the reason why we chose the publisher that we wanted to do, or, or that we eventually went with, because it, they allowed us the freedom to do the book and design it in this way that, say, if we would have gone through a, a strictly academic press, um, which is also what we were, were thinking about, I think this book wouldn't have been Forty-eight dollars at Amazon. It would have been like a hundred something um, with all of like the color photographs and everything. So there's there's a whole bunch of different considerations, but I think part of it is that we had a publisher that was that believed in the project that wanted to get the project off the ground, um, and then they also were willing to work with us in terms of the kind of book that uh, we wanted it to be. Yeah, Cocktail Publishing was very good to us, um, and I think the way that it came about is a metaphor for the project as a whole. We started off first getting the stories without a publisher, so we had existing stories, and then someone basically just let it, you know, let it be published, but it was already there. We didn't have to, it wasn't the other way around when they approached us and we had to gather. They were already there. We already had all, our, not all the stories, probably like 40% of our, of our material because we, we know it already. Right? So I think that was just a bigger metaphor of, of this project. Thanks very much. For <laughs> <laughs> we just want to let you all know that there are copies up here for purchase. So support community-based research yeah. <laughs> and uh, put back into the community. It's only 40 bucks. I mean, that's what, like a couple of lunches, right? Like a week of food, we can give it up. One more time oh, for the co-editors. <laughs> so should we take a break? Just roll right in. Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, so we're going to roll into this regional Filipino-American hip-hop scenes panel. Um, and I get the pleasure of introducing Dr. Robin Magalit Rodriguez. Who, yes, <laughs> who grew up in Union City, the daughter of Filipino immigrants. She attended UCSB, where she majored in sociology and took classes in Asian American studies. And then she went on to earn her PhD in sociology at UC Berkeley. Uh, her book, yes, yes, yes. Her, bo her book, Migrants for Export, How the Philippines Brokers Labor to the World, won an honorable, best mention, uh, honorable mention for Best Book in Social Science by the Association for Asian American Studies. Uh, her co-authored book, this. Asian America, Sociological and Interdisciplinary Approaches, will be published uh, this year by Polity Press. Oh, it just came out. Ah, nice, okay. And currently, she's finishing a book entitled In Lady Liberty's Shadow, Race and Immigration in Post-9-11 New Jersey, to be published by Rutgers University in 2015. She co-founded the League of Filipino Students, formed the Critical Filipino Studies Collective, and works closely with the National Alliance for Filipino Concerns. Dr. Rodriguez. Thank you. 
Dr. Cotton Candy because she's an expert in hip hop. I'm not an expert on hip hop. Um, so I think I'm really here to rep Union City. Where my people at? Union City in the house? Really? Oh, that's different. That's different. <laughs> okay, put your hands in the air if you're from Union City. You can claim Union City. I'll give you permission. I'll give you permission. If, okay, how about if you know Union City? Put your hands in the air. Yeah, okay. Okay, what about San Ho? You know San Ho. Where are you from? If, you're, if you're from San Ho, again, raise your hand if you know that you know San Ho, of course, because you got family from there, you got people from there. Um, okay, what's another place? Jersey City. Jersey City. Okay, put your hands in there. If you're from there, put your hands in the air if you know Jersey City. You know it. You know it. Kalihi. Kalihi. Y'all are Filipinos in Kalihi, right? Okay, what else? Shuttle, shuttle. Put your hands in the air if you're from Seattle. Put your hands in the air if you you know about Seattle. Or Cerritos, that's a good one. Cerritos, Cerritos in the house. Put your hands in the air if you know Cerritos. Put right, okay. We could go on and on and on. And why did I start like that? Because... I aspire, you know, to be, um, yes. <laughs> but actually, I am very honored to be here. Um, and as I said, I was a little surprised to get the invite. I do teach Filipino American studies, um, but I'm no means an expert. But what this was is an example of local knowledge. And this is something that came up earlier with Jeff's talk. Um, and again, it's actually probably exactly why I can be here on this on this panel. Coming up in Union City, um, hip hop was a very much a part of my life. And I think that's true for many of you. We know what we know. We know Union City. We know Cerritos. We know Jersey City. We know Kalihi. We know Seattle. We know National City. We know San Diego. We know Satan San Ho. I know we know Jacksonville now. <laughs> We know Virginia Beach. Um, we can go on and on and on. We know what we know. Um, we can point out key localities in Filipino America, not because there is a map out there that we can buy, not because there is a map that we can Google. We know it because we live it. We know it because we've been there. We know it because we got people there. We know it because we heard it from our people. This is what we call local knowledge. And hip hop is the means, you know, and we think about a map, right? You know, map has these lines, right? These contour lines, they orient us, latitude, longitude. Uh, if you think about hip hop as a kind of contour line, um, it's the means through which we make connections uh, to one another in these various locales as, as um, folks committed to hip hop or as Filipino Americans. Um, it's what a scholar calls translocality, and we're gonna talk about translocality later. Um, at the same time, the distribution of these places in space and the travels of people and culture through these places is how hip hop has thrived and emerged. Um, you know, there's a big, vast academic uh, literature on hip hop and what we're, we're learning is that local knowledge is how many of our folks got into it. I mean, I think everybody, and, and I think what's wonderful about the book is it has all of these stories, and in almost all the stories, hip hop was not something we necessarily learned in a formal way, right? We didn't learn it in a formal way. We got it from our older siblings, kuyas and ates, or cousins, manongs and manangs, maybe even an uncle. Now, for y'all, you guys are young. You'd probably be even learning it from your pops, right? Your dad. Um, you got it from friends. DJ equipment was always passed on. Um, that's definitely the case in, you know, my brother got inherited equipment from friends. If you danced, you didn't get formal dance training. You didn't do that. You were working out your moves in the garage or the basement. <laughs> backyard on some old linoleum, right? From when your parents redid the house. <laughs> it's true. 
Um, it's kind of greasy still, too. <laughs> the first places we performed was at birthday parties for families and friends, a Sweet 16, a debut. Or maybe we signed up for the local battle um, that was organized at the high school. You know, I was one of the organizers for the dad, the battles because I was in student government. I love it. Um, but that's what we did. You know, I mean, we were the sorts of people, we, we supported one another. Uh, we performed at homecoming, even maybe prom, right? That's local knowledge. That's local practices. And again, you know, this is very distinct from major industry venues, right? The knowledge is produced about hip hop um, by the industry or capital. Um, but you know, even as we can map a Filipino-American geography, we also know that there are differences, right? And so this is, we can, we identify one another, we can orient one another, um, but there are places that don't, don't get mapped, and as you can hear from Mark, the real importance to bringing into view um, other sites that we may not kind of hear about. Um, and also, there are just differences, even those locales, right? I was teaching at New, in New Jersey for about six years um, at Rutgers. And so when I came back, people would be like, oh, how was the East Coast? And then my answer was always, there's, you know, people would be like, aren't there hella Filipinos in New Jersey? And I'd be like, yeah, but they're different. <laughs> Not in the bad way. But I'm saying, uh, it's, it's about understanding kind of the distinctiveness of our various kind of formations um, in different localities, even as we form these forms, these kinds of connections through hip hop. So that's what we're asking the artists to do today, to talk about um, their local knowledge, local regional scenes, uh, how hip hop originated and um, grew in their own lives. So I'm gonna do, you know, cause I actually don't think most of them need introduction, cause I think y'all, everybody started buying the books all of a sudden so that they can get um, the, uh, their, um, their books signed. But we have, do you want me to, I'm gonna hand it over sure. to you so we can spit the oh, introductions, sure. yeah? Yeah, okay, sure. Right. You got it? Yeah, sure. Uh, so we'll go ahead and introduce everybody and then everybody's gonna kind of come up. I guess we'll get, Oliver's gonna be up here doing the presentation, we'll get some extra chairs over here and get the panel set up. Um, Oliver Wong is an associate professor of sociology at CSU Long Beach. His book on the Filipino-American mobile DJ scene in the Bay Area, Legions of Boom, is going to be published uh, by Duke University Press in spring of 2015. Uh, we also have Sean Slesser, who's a PhD candidate in history at UC Riverside. His dissertation looks at Filipino participation in 1980s and 1990s LA hip hop culture with an eye towards how that participation was shaped by U.S. imperialism in the Philippines and post-Watts Rebellion, L.A. in his free time. Should I read that, Sean? You really want me to read that? No, about your hair? I'll talk to you. Yeah? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna, no, I'm going to slide out. Right. I'm going to slide mine out. Because <laughs> you look good, man. You look good. Thank he had a little thing you. here about his hair, how he used to have more hair. And used to. It's, yeah. All right. Old folks stuff. Um, Mark Polito is the mayor of Cerritos. Yes. yes, the mayor. Where's the mayor? I see the mayor. Um, his hometown, of, there you are. What's up, mayor? Uh, the, his hometown of 42 years and the hometowns of the likes of the pioneering Filipino American Mola DJ Cruz. Members of the world famous Beat Junkies, DJ Red Manic in the house. Crooks and Castles and countless poppers, B boys, B girls, and dance crews over the past three decades. Mayor Polito started popping in 79, DJing in 1981. Breaking in 1983, organizing college dances and DJ battles in 1987, promoting clubs in 1989, culminating in 1992's historic Unity Jam at UCLA. Uh, blessed with a loving wife and two wonderful kids, Mayor Polito got his start in youth organizing in 1984, student and community organizing in 1987, campus governance in 1991, political organizing in 1986, and serving in elective public office in 2001, uh, the local school board and since 2011 on the city council, the mayor, Mark Polito. <laughs> uh, we also have Bamboo in the house. Bam's a father, MC, a community organizer raised in the Watts district of LA. As a young boy, he experienced a life that other rappers have glorified but rarely experienced. As he navigated through a turbulent youth, Bamboo turned around the destructive energy that surrounded him, poured it into 
making music. You all know him, you all love him. He's bamboo. <laughs> welcome, welcome. So give it up for our panelists.